Ezra is allowed to return, allowed to lead another remnant to return to Israel. God's hand is on him, providing and protecting for him until he arrived only to see the infidelity of the first wave. And Paul speaks of disciplined sacrificial evangelism. Today on 3 and 1, as we consider Ezra chapter 7 through 9 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I've made a new friend in the last few weeks, and last Friday we were talking about our kiddos, and he was sharing with me the scriptures that he had concerning his kids' names. And this scripture was one of the ones that he shared, for he has a son named Ezra. And this is his heart for his son named Ezra. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. See, Ezra was an honorable man with a heart to help his people. God saw that and had his hand upon this man with great grace meaning that God gave Ezra favor with the authorities all around him as he endeavored to also return to Israel with yet another remnant to continue to rebuild and to continue to restore. And from the looks of the letter in chapter 7, we can see quite clearly the hand of God giving Ezra favor with man. This is a wise prayer. For God to give us great grace, great favor with men, opening doors, opportunities to do his work that wouldn't open any other way. God can do that. Proverbs 21.1 says, In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. So we see God moved the heart of King Artaxerxes to help Ezra, writing him a letter. And the letter is really incredible. I mean, reading through it, just think through, can you imagine our current king, our current administration writing a letter like this? Writing, whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. I mean, funding the entire journey and whatever else Ezra felt was necessary once he got there. Yes, this is a wise prayer to ask God to give favor with men. So at the end of chapter seven, Ezra says, I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. So he assembled them at the river Ahava, and he had them fast and pray, because there was one thing that he didn't think he should ask for from the king, a military escort. See, it was an extremely dangerous journey through the desert from Babylon to Jerusalem. But there was a, a reason that Ezra didn't ask for this military escort. It, it, we read, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all for those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. And I love the honesty there. Ezra says, Man, we, we already told the king that the hand of our great God was upon us, so it'd be kind of embarrassing to be asking the king for protection. But we really do need protection. So let's make sure that God knows that we really need his protection. Kind of reminds me of the time that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were talking to Nebuchadnezzar and said, our God can save us from this fiery furnace, and, and, and even if he doesn't, we want you to know we will not bow. I can imagine the other two listening to the one saying that, thinking, yeah, yeah, wait, what? Even if he doesn't help us. See, I think it's possible to be full of faith and full of fear all at the same time. I think we've mistakenly say that those two things are mutually exclusive, but I, I'm just not sure that's correct. There's times where you're full of faith, but you're also fully aware of the worst that could happen. And you have fear inside, but you still choose to do what's right. See, I think that's faith-filled courage. I believe that's the true definition of, of courage, being well aware of the worst that could happen and still choosing to do what's right. 
And so Ezra courageously continues this journey to Jerusalem. Now, just imagine the first wave, the first remnant that returned to rebuild years ago. Those were heroes in the mind of Ezra. He probably couldn't wait to be encouraged by their faith and their integrity. And yet, instead, what he found when he got there was infidelity and compromise. And that would be enough to to crush a man of God. And it just about did, as we read in chapter 9, as Ezra poured out his lament the lament of his broken heart to the Lord. Now, what exactly was he so brokenhearted about? Well, he was torn up by how his heroes were not living lives worthy of God's glory. In in full view of all that God had done for them and graciously allowing them to return, to rebuild, he said, for we were slaves Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And yet, even after all of that grace, the remnant that returned took God's grace for granted and settled into infidelity and sin. Fidelity. It's such an awesome word. Infidelity is such an awful word. See, fidelity means faithfulness to a person, cause, or belief demonstrated by continued loyalty. And obviously, infidelity is the opposite. Unfaithfulness to a person, cause, or belief demonstrated by continued disloyalty. Now, which one describes you? in view of God's mercy upon your life? Fidelity or infidelity in your relationship with Jesus? In view of his grace upon our lives, in view of his mercy upon our lives, the only rational response is to offer ourselves entirely to him as a living sacrifice. And that's something that Paul the Apostle wrote about in Romans chapter 12. But today we read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul talked about one of the ways that this kind of complete surrender can manifest itself in disciplined, sacrificial evangelism. And he used himself as an example, endeavoring to be all things to all men that he might win some. We read, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now, this I do for the gospel's sake. Now, what did that look like? It, it looked like this. It meant that with extreme intentionality, Paul examined whatever particular culture he was entering into, and he lived his life in such a disciplined way in order to tactfully teach them the truths of the gospel. And oh, how this is needed today, tactfully teaching truth, avoiding needless offense, and delivering tough truths with gentleness and respect and and precision. And for Paul, that meant discipline and intentionality and personal sacrifice in his personal life. Because if his personal life was not in order, his words would not have any weight in any culture. So in each and every culture he walked into, it was important to Paul, for the gospel's sake, to be tactful, not only with his words, but also with his life. And again, that meant discipline, intentionality, and personal sacrifice. And for the sake of the gospel... You and I have the same opportunities in view of God's mercy upon our lives. We read this today in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Listen to that last passage in the the children's Bible. In a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. You know that, don't you? So run in a way that will get you the prize. 
All who take part in the games train hard. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So I do not run like someone who doesn't run toward the finish line. I do not fight like a boxer who hits nothing but air. No, I train my body and bring it under control. Then after I have preached to others, I myself will not break the rules and fail to win the prize.